episode 109. You can get all the show notes and resources at dadhackers.us slash 109. What's up, Dad Hackers? My name is Patrick Antonucci, and I am the host and founder of this podcast and community of Dad Hackers. Dad Hackers is a community of Christian fathers who are devoted to encouraging, equipping, and enabling one another to become the men that God has created and called us to be so that we can raise up the next generation of fully devoted followers of Christ and leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. Now, on this show, we primarily interview Christian men to dive deep into their experiences and insights into what it means to be a Christian man, a Christian husband, a Christian father, and a Christian leader. We ask questions that dig deep into the thinking and rationale and experiences of these men so that we can all learn and grow into the men that God is calling us to be. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Make sure you subscribe so that you never miss any of our value-packed episodes. Also, please make sure you leave an honest review if you're listening to this in iTunes or any other platform that takes reviews. Reviews boost the show's ratings, which means that more dads are going to come across our show and benefit from the content that we put out. I also wanted to let you know that we do have a free private Facebook group just for Christian dads. So after the show, make sure you hop on over to the show notes. There's a link for that in there as well. All right, Paul, how are you doing today, man? Doing fantastic. Great to be on Dad Hackers. Yeah, great to have you on, man. So why don't you start us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, context as a, as a Christian husband, father, and what it is exactly that you do. Man, you want me to go back to, I was born as a poor sharecropper's son. Do you want me to go that far back? <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I, I steward a ministry now, Patrick, that is uh, over the last 12 years, uh, we're a human justice mission focused on defeating fatherlessness and ending child abuse. And so to that end, we use materials that help mentor men to help shape them into the man that God designed them to be. Now, my background is media, marketing, inter entertainment, and my father wrote a series of books starting about 40 years ago, Maximize Manhood, a number of other books. He passed away 18 years ago, and uh, before he did, just before he did, we put those into a curriculum. Five years after he passed away, my wife and I, uh, at the urging of a number of friends, uh, fully committed to take his curriculum and retraction it. And, uh, and now it's, it's in 134 countries. So we're really thankful for what the Lord's done. You know, it's, it's kind of like dad hackers, right? You know, you, you say, well, I'm thankful for what God's done, but it's also been a lot of work. <laughs> of course, of course, ton of work, yeah. ton of work. So that's what we do. It's called Christian Men's Network and the Global Fatherhood Initiative. That's great, man. I appreciate the work you do for men. It's, it's much needed uh, in the States here and, and across the world. Of course. Yeah. So tell me about your family. Well, uh, happily married for over 40 years. My wife says it's getting high enough that she doesn't want anybody to know anymore. But it's over 40 years, and uh, that's to my wife, Judy's credit, three children and uh, nine grandchildren. And so uh, I love being abuelo, man. I love being papa. Uh, you know, grew up in the 60s in California, so I'm a Cali guy, and, and my wife was born in San Francisco in the city. I was born in uh, La Jolla, California. Grew up in Santa Cruz, and so I, there's this, um, you know, sort of flavor, kind of this uh, filter that, that everything goes through for me, and, and I love immersion. I love uh, full immersion. I love doing what I do to help men become followers of Christ and to really kind of start to lean into what that means. Men are like trees, Patrick. They tend to fall the way they're leaning. So I look at my role as helping men lean the right direction. And there you go. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, uh, and just kind of become like, man, this is awesome. You know, and really sort of get into the depth of what it means to be a follower of Christ and be fully human. So what does it mean to lean in the right direction? When you see a guy, maybe let's even back up. 
how do we know if we're leaning in the wrong direction? <laughs> you know what? I think most guys know. It's like one time I was, I was playing golf and this guy was just swearing like crazy, man. He'd miss a putt and he's cursing. And about the 12th hole, he finally goes, hey, hey, man, what do you, what do, you do? And so I just had to do this to him. I go, well, I'm a minister. <laughs> he goes, pardon my French, man. So uh, I go, dude, that was not French. I know French. <laughs> and then he said, then here's what happens. The next six holes, he's like, he starts telling me stuff. Like, you know, I haven't really been living right. I haven't really been doing the right thing. Hmm. There's uh, C.S. Lewis said there's a, a moral law that operates, which is how he came to Christ at the urging of Tolkien, you know, is that he began to look at why is something wrong here? and Why is it wrong in the other side of the world? Why do I have, why do we all have a sense that taking somebody's stuff is wrong? Hmm. And why do they have the same sense? Why isn't it okay in some cultures? And you begin to look at it, there's moral law. Well, we know that's the kingdom of heaven, the overarching thing. So I think most of us, you know, we kind of have a sense of, of uh, if I'm ripping off people's stuff, if I'm, uh, if I'm hyperinflating things that I, my reputation, and, you know, I mean, people know, man, you know, people, people have a sense of that. There's a sense of morality. And then how do we lean the right direction? You know, it's, uh, I think that, that once we figure out there is a moral law and there's a code, we have to find, okay, who wrote the code? Where'd that come from? Because obviously somebody wrote it. It didn't just happen out of the, the Big Bang theory. So if we start looking at that, then we have to say, okay, there's a moral code that has a, has a personality to it. And if I lean towards that, my life will be better. And so, uh, and of course, we point people to Jesus Christ. He came as the light, the word. And when men get the revelation of that, you know, conversion process is all about beginning to lean the right way. We're, we're, you know, when you become a follower of Christ, it's not mm -hmm. like, bam, everything changes. That's why it's called the process of conversion. And uh, I think we're all in process. Right on, man. And that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to continuously sanctify you and make you more like Christ. Man, no kidding. Lean, in, lean into him. The Holy Hound of Heaven. That's another C.S. Lewis one. Yeah. Yeah, that the Holy Spirit is there. And here's the thing, Patrick, you know, sometimes we feel like, well, I've either screwed up bad enough or I've disqualified my life. And the beauty of the Word of God is it's so honest about so many things like Jonah. Jonah is a guy that if anybody should have just God, should, if I'd have been God, I'd have just said, you know what, you're done. Mm -hmm. he, he tells God, God says, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh. A lot of guys who've read the Bible know this story because it's the guy who gets swallowed by a whale or a fish. God tells him, go do this project, go to Nineveh, tell them that I'm going to rescue them if they'll turn to me. And, and Jonah's like, these are bad guys. These are pirates. It's a city of pirates. It's at the time the wealthiest city in the entire world. You can look in world history on that one. And God tells them, go there and, and you can help them turn towards me and they're going to their lives are going to be changed. Jonah's going, that's a bad idea. And he tells God to his face, bad idea. Hmm. And he gets in a boat going the other direction, gets in a big storm. He goes, it's my fault. And so then he attempts suicide. He tells the guys, throw me off the boat. He knows he's going to die. And God won't let him die. And here's a man that, that basically told God to his face, yeah, I think this is a really bad idea. <laughs> and then ran. And then when he tries to commit suicide, God saves his life because he sends a fish to swallow him while he's drowning. And then he turns around, and as the Bible account goes, it turns around, and a few days later, three days later, which is a type of Christ, mm -hmm. third day, turns around, and he, the, it says the fish vomits him on the shore of this beach. And where is he? He's right near Nineveh. So what God did is put him back into his original destiny. Bible, I love the Bible uh, when Paul said in Romans, he says, there's thou, therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen. And uh, God never put people down because they were jacked up. You know, he, it was like the, the guys, in fact, he was most mad at were the guys who had it, quote unquote, all together. You know, and, and they could quote the scripture, but they couldn't live it. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that. I love that whole piece, Patrick, that Zacchaeus is up a tree. 
Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Jesus looks at him and he's a crook. He's a tax collector, which uh, at the time was for this terrorist group called the Romans. And he, and he goes, you know what? I'm coming to your house, man. So Jonah, Jonah should have been disqualified. Zacchaeus, he should have been disqualified. And every time, man, God jumps in and goes, no, no, no. Here's the deal. You've got something in you. I placed in you. And you were put here on earth for a purpose. So uh, let's go after this thing. So arrested by God, right? Right on, man. So do, does that purpose apply to all men or do you, is this just specific men? Oh, yeah. I think there's only some really good people and everybody else is kind of like dust. Cogs in the wheel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just, yeah, you know, whatever. Do your thing and just keep the economy going. Uh, I, you know, the Bible is very, very clear. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the psalmist says, also, you know, in my mother's womb, you saw me. Ephesians 2, 10 says, says you're God's creation. In fact, he says, you're my masterpiece. I created you for good works. He's talking to every single person. There's not one person, regardless of how they got here, regardless of, the, of, of how the egg and the sperm came together, regardless of how all that all happened, there's no breath of life that's happened apart from God. Colossians says that everything was made in Christ, by him, for him, and, and then it says by him all things are held together. He came as a light, so we know quantum physics says everything's held together by that. That's Christ. And, and then we know that, that uh, when God says um, to the first man, you know, he says, I want to hang out with you. Um, he didn't make mankind with a word. He spoke the word. You know, if, on the creation account, he's, he's like speaking, bam, there's mountains, bam, rivers, speaking, there's fish. It's all this stuff. And then when it comes to mankind, he reaches down with his hands and forms mankind. We were made to be intimate with God. And I think there's something that happens with guys when they find that. It's like, dude, this is what I was looking for all along. This is why I followed Maharishi Yogananda. This is why I was doing peyote. This is why I was doing all this stuff it's for this. And so, uh, so there's a war going on, man. There's a war, and the enemy's trying to keep us from finding that amazing thing called grace and love mm -hmm. and a father who validates us. So what has it meant to you personally to know that you were created and formed intentionally by God for a purpose as part of his overall plan? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And you just nailed it right there. Uh, I have a mentor who's actually younger than me. His name's Leonard Sweet. He's a writer and author. But uh, he wrote a book called The Well-Played Life. And, and he and I had already been talking about this, that there's a purpose for each of our lives, but a plan for mankind. And and I wrote it in a book called Just a Bartender, which is based on the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, uh, the Bible says, in fact, it's a book. The guy's got a, a book written about him. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and, and it says he's the cupbearer for the king. And so I figured, Patrick, that means he's the king's bartender. <laughs> and he's a bartender and a slave, and yet something pivots in him, and he becomes the rebuilder of Jerusalem, which is 1,700 miles away from where he lives. And what pivoted in him is his identity, his identity. And, you know, so for, for me, in, in all of these things in our lives, you know, it comes back to that core, you know, identity. Who am I? And uh, what has God created me to be? And, and so when I was growing up, man, I was told, hey, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Patrick, by the time I was in eighth grade, surfing on the coast of California with, with a, a 1965, the summer of love and hate Ashbury started and all that stuff. By the time I was in ninth grade, Patrick, I figured whatever that plan was, I've already screwed it up. Mm. I, I mean, because it's, it's a plan and you got to find this plan. And I'm like, dude, I already blew it up, man. So what I began to discover was that it's not a set of railroad tracks that if I don't find those tracks, my life is jacked up. I'm messed over. I, I didn't find the right tracks, man. I could have had a great life. Could have been somebody. Couldn't find the tracks. 
And then I found out you, you actually get to color your life in. Um, and that God loves people who color outside the lines. And Jesus hung out with all kinds of people who colored outside the lines. And, and that he has a purpose for my life. And my purpose is to glorify him and to create legacy and to establish his kingdom and, and hang out with people who are positive and uplifting and then help other people who aren't there to, to move towards that. And how cool is that? I mean, that's like, it's like, uh, I think, I think it's, uh, uh, what's his face? The guy that did the, uh, uh, the message, you mm -hmm. know, when he wrote that, uh, he said, he talked about sin being like a sickness, like an illness, like a thing that holds us back from becoming fully us. And uh, think about helping people get set free of a virus, like this virus thing going on. Think about how cool that would be to be the guy who finds the vaccine or finds the, the, the way to treat people or whatever the thing is. How cool would that be, right? Louis Pasteur, how cool would it have been to be that guy? Stop childhood diseases. and How cool is it to help somebody else come to a fullness of what they were created to be? So, man, I, I, I dig being a follower of Christ. I absolutely love uh, everything that that does in my life. And I love being human, and I love being part of the world, and I love hanging out right now, right now because of all the restrictions. I'm ha we're hanging out on our driveway, and our friends are, our neighbors are hanging out in their driveways, and we're all <laughs> social distancing and hanging out and talking to each other. There you go. You know, and my wife's organized the thing in the circle, and we're going to kind of close down our little neighborhood tonight. We're all going to sit eight feet away or something in lawn chairs. You know, we were made for community, Patrick. Of course. You know, we were made for that. Before God was anything else, he was God in community. And, and I think that is, uh, for me, uh, shoot, man, as a guy, you know, as a man, mm -hmm. we love being on teams, right? I mean, look yeah. at you. You're wearing a hat, bro. We're looking. We can see each other if you can't because we're doing the way we're doing this. And you got a hat. You got like a team hat on, right? Team dad hacker. Yep. Team dad hacker. <laughs> it's like a like it's a team. It's a badge. It's a thing. And, and we love that, man. We love being a part of something that's bigger than us. And I get to be a part of this family called the followers of Christ and this, you know, children of God that that he loves and gives us grace. And so uh, it's a pretty amazing thing to help people come to a place where they find their fullness, who they really are. So I'm, I'm digging the whole thing, man. I love every single bit of being a dad and a grandpa and uh, learning more about it every day and finding new and wonderful ways of expressing that. Yeah. So you, in your explanation there, you, you talked about leaving a legacy and I wanted to make sure yeah. in, in the limited time that we have, that we hit on that because that is a big piece of why dad hackers exists is to empower men to become the men that they've created and designed to be so that they can leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. So Paul, what, what does it mean to you to leave a legacy and what are some things that you're being intentional and purposeful and consistent about? Yeah. Good question. Because I think we do have to be intentional. Otherwise, you know, most of us as men kind of, uh, we have a tendency to live life based on what comes up next. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're not intentional. And we need a vision for our lives. A, a man without a vision for his future will always return to his past. You'll never move beyond where you are unless you're looking where you want to go. And then you got to start moving in a direction. So legacy is this for me. What a man does in life becomes history. But what he puts in the motion becomes his legacy. And I have a hundred year vision right now at the age that I am in my sixties. And I've got a dream of a hundred years from now, a hundred million men being impacted by the things that I'm putting into motion right now in my life and out of my life. So I've got this vision. It's a hundred years, man. You know, uh, Walt Disney world, when Disney world was open years ago, Walt Disney had, uh, the one in Florida, when they opened Disney World, his wife was there. It was his widow because he had died five years before Disney World opened. A reporter came up to Mrs. Disney and he said, uh, you know, it's a shame that your husband didn't see this today, the grand opening. Hmm. She said, oh, but he did see it. That's why it's here. 
Yeah. Man, and that's it right there. I, I can see great, great grandchildren that based on, so, so why, why would I not do porn if it brings me pleasure, right? Why would I not do porn if it gives me a half hour of just kind of like a little medicinal sidebar? Maybe it's more than just the photos and the things and this and that, it, uh, you know, the sin moment and the shame stuff that happens. Maybe it's really more about what is the DNA spiritually that I'm putting in my grandkids. Maybe the fight is really a fight for them. And if I really want to be a man, I mean, the, the Native Americans uh, had, had this. Their, their transition into manhood was helping young people, and they would fight for them, and they would help them, and, and it was everything about the next generation. And if I'm fighting for the next generation, this whole thing of, of uh, you know, not, not drinking too much alcohol, not getting drunk, um, all the things that we know inhibit our lives, porn, whatever it may be, any kind of self-medicating. I'm, why am I fighting that? I'm fighting it because it's for my grandkids and for their kids and their kids after that. That's legacy. So I'll fight for that, man. I'll fight for that. You know, the same way you fight for your, you know, your nation or something like that when there's a battle. Shoot, man. You know, uh, we were made to be warriors, Patrick. And there's a thing in every single man's life, which is why this deal right now, it, the shelter in place, in other words, telling men, go home sit down, don't do anything when we're actually problem solvers, mm -hmm. causing a lot of guys a lot of problems. I was talking to John Eldridge the other day, who's a writer and author, and he wrote a book called Wild at Heart and a bunch of other stuff. Never heard of him. And, yeah, and I said, John, what's, <laughs> what's the answer on that deal? And he goes, every man, <laughs> every man needs a trash can lid and a baseball bat. All right, guys, wanted to take a quick second to tell you about the Iron Men Mastermind. If you're looking for a band of brothers that you can lock shields with, that can go to battle with you in the day-to-day -day life, who are also in the trenches going through the same struggles and the same challenges that you are going through, I suggest you check out the Iron Men Mastermind. This mastermind was developed and designed for Christian men to help us become the men that God has created and called us to be. And it's designed to help us increase our relationship with God, increase our relationship with our wives, increase our relationship with our children, and begin to provide better for them financially, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, in all of those areas, those areas that those things that wake you up in the middle of the night. These are the kinds of things that we work on. These are the kinds of ways that we can help you out in the Ironman Mastermind. If this is something that is of interest to you, you may want to join the Ironman community and you can check out more information at dadhackers.us slash Ironman, one word, Ironman there. All right, now back to our show. <laughs> oh, I do. What? Love the imagery there. Where, where are you going with that? He goes, take the trash can lid out back, take a baseball bat and beat the hell out of the trash can lid. Then go back in and hug your kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, yeah. So what are we fighting for, man? It's otherwise we're just so myopic and narcissistic and selfish and self-centered and most of us as guys are and that's why following christ helps, helps set me free from that because that whole narcissism is the law of sin and death because narcissism it eventually becomes death i like how you put leaving a legacy in terms of a of a, of a warrior mindset because mm -hmm. i think a lot of times the message to men is to be pure be good be nice stay inside the lines, do the right thing. Be a and nice while, guy, man. Come on. Yeah. And are you kidding me? Think <laughs> about the guys that hung out with Jesus. Think about now he chose those guys. They didn't just show up. Hey, everybody line up here. I'll take the first 12. He chose those guys and he chose some guys with some issues, man. They fought with each other. They had, 
they had doubts they had stuff and um man but but think about it how awesome were their lives man the stuff they did the stuff they put into motion the adventure they were on and i want to leave some footprints man i don't want to have passed this way and everybody go yeah wasn't paul a nice guy yeah he's a nice guy (laughs) then there you go (laughs) dust in the wind right yeah yeah, I think the um, the warrior mindset, the biblical warrior mindset, is needs to be reclaimed in the church, particularly, yeah. obviously, among men. And um, I think it, it's because you hit the nail on the head. We have a fight in us. Each man mm-hmm. has a desire to fight. And I think that's a lar- large part of Christianity misses that aspect. And I think a lot of guys are set on fire when they when they realize that that we are in a fight you 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 want to battle porn yes because it's bad and it makes you imp- impure but i was t- talking with david moreau the guy that wrote uh, why yeah. men hate going to church and he said yeah. no no talk to talk to men about how it makes you impotent it makes you less yeah. powerful right. to look at pornography and be promiscuous and and when you're when you're doing the right thing sexually you are a more powerful man. And just like you said, you know, what DNA are you putting into the future? I, I just love how you put that, man. Yeah, man. You know, the porn, the whole porn thing, and that's a big deal because it's been so normalized. And, and uh, you know, guys will stand around and talk about, hey, did you see this new episode by so-and-so? And, no, I haven't seen it. I'll have to look at it tonight. The fact is those guys are vaporizing their lives. You know, they're destroying their brains, first of all. And we know uh, all the chemical reactions that happen with dopamine and and all these things that happen and, and we create we create syntax or pathways for our brains to not so we end up not thinking straight not thinking right so how many times you know that whole deal where they catch guys that are um predators yeah the online predators and, and, and we've yeah, all trying to meet up with on, kids yeah and you're like oh dude man you just destroyed your life and now they put your picture on the paper and you know there's a guy yesterday where i live in texas that was a teacher in a junior high and his photos like on the front page of the, of my iPad, like, dude, that guy's like, bro, you just, you just ruined this whole thing. And, and you know what? Every one of them say, um, I didn't mean for this to happen. I knew it was wrong. I don't know why I did it. And you know what it was <laughs> every time, every single time, man, it's a porn addiction that has created uh, pathways in the brain in which where you would normally the pathway of the brain to go this way, it makes a left turn and you make a decision totally based on a pathway you've built that isn't normal. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you can study all this stuff out. It's pretty amazing, but it also takes your energy. It wastes a lot of time. You know, uh, it, it uh, fogs your decision-making and it actually, this is a fascinating thing that behavioral scientists uh, I found out from behavioral psychologists is, and we know it's spiritually, it disconnects you from your wife. Even if you say the right things, if you're married, uh, it, you say the right things, you kind of act the right thing. But the reality is you've disconnected something. And uh, what behavioral psychologists tell us is that guys who are doing porn, their wives have a greater tendency to have affairs. Hmm. And uh, so in other words, you do porn, she has an affair, but it is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> dude man if you if you start thinking about the ramifications of that and all this stuff man it's like dude okay i'm gonna fight this thing and john 10 10 as a follower of christ john 10 10 says the thief comes to steal kill and destroy and then jesus is the one talking this is the red letters and he said but i've come to give you life and life to the fullest so the fight the reason that that jesus taught men to pray the Lord's prayer is actually the disciples' prayer because he taught him. He said, here's how to pray. So, you know, do that. Just do the Lord's prayer. Do something. But because prayer, the power of prayer is it strips away the inconsequential. Why did Jesus pray, Patrick? I mean, think about this. Why did Jesus pray? To connect with the Father. Yeah. But he's all God, and his father's all God. So why couldn't he just take 30 seconds and say, hey, are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and the father goes, yeah, right. Well, you know, we're both God, so probably thinking the same thing. 
You know, it's like Jesus never did anything outside the will of the Father. The temptations of Christ, the three temptations that the enemy brought, were never to do evil, but to do something okay outside of the will of God. Making bread was not like an evil thing. So, so this whole uh, piece of following Christ and getting a vision of who I can be and the whole prayer piece and getting the Word of God in us, Proverbs 4 says, what you have in your heart actually begins to form your life. All behavior follows belief. All decisions are made off of definition. And so that's why, that's why these things are important. The prayer strips away stuff that doesn't belong. Why did Jesus pray? Because there's so many people pulling on him, so many directions. Mm. And so he prayed in order to keep his humanity centered. Because vision in a man's life is forged in the discipline to extract themselves from the unnecessary. We live a life of distractions. Everything is distracting. That's, that's, so that's true, one of the man. issues. And it's just, bam, it's eight, you know, 56,000 things. Our self-talk is 500 words a minute. There's just all this stuff and traffic. And the Word of God begins to give me revelation, illumination of who I am, who He is. And in the light of who He is, I then find out who my true self is. And what I'm willing to look at and become my true self, what I was designed to be. Now I can live my purpose out. And, uh, and I love it because now I can color it in. I get to color it in. It's fantastic, man. The freedom of following Christ, because people always think of religion, laws, and rules and regulations. A friend of mine says that his church, when he was growing up, had, had so many rules that even God couldn't follow them. <laughs> and uh, we think of it like that. The, the Bible's not a handbook for life with rules and regulations and you know, things, it, it's, it's a revelation of Christ. And once you find that, there's such a freedom in that. It's like, dude, the freedom of not living under a cloud of shame. Man, there's nothing like that, bro. Right? Amen. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. Sure is. I know we got to wrap it up soon, but I wanted to ask you if you could maybe fire off a couple bullet point things that you did with your kids or slash are doing with your grandkids or maybe even doing with your adult kids yeah. that guys could really latch on to because I think a lot of guys, me included, if we get an idea for something, we could take it and run with it. We, we just need yeah. that, like that launching yeah. pad, you know, what are some tangible things that you did to intentionally invest in your children to put that legacy. In yeah. Motion. I'll give you, I'll give you just a few things. Uh, grandchildren and you know, uh, my kids, uh, my kids, I traveled a lot. I was in business. Uh, my dad was a minister and we lived in a bunch of different places cause his denomination moved him around. And, and, uh, I decided when I, when I got old enough to have children and all that, I, they would, I was going to get a house and they were going to live in it while they were in school. The whole time they were in school, we're going to live in the same house. So that was something for me. Not everybody can do that, but it was, you know, having roots. And my daughter, who's 42 now, has the same, has a group of uh, nine or 10 friends that she's still friends with that she started coming over. They came over to my house in third grade. Here's another thing I did. It, I wanted everybody at my house. I mean, if I had to buy extra food, if I had to put you know, more, more, Cokes in the, you know, refrigerator or Dr. Pepper's down here in Texas or whatever, you know, Mountain Dews, then dude, that's the price of making sure that I know where these kids are. And so our house was always packed with people and it wasn't always like ideal. It was, you know, parenting doesn't happen at the right time. Mm. You know, it's, it's always while you're busy. And especially as a guy, it's you're, you're parenting kids while you're trying to build your career. Yep. And so that was always a balance, but here's another thing that, that happened. So I, I did that. We did that. And I'd go, my wife would go, Hey, these, these five kids coming over, I'd go, let's order a pizza or do something. We just make some more spaghetti. And, uh, and then another thing was uh, the minute I walked in the front door, Patrick, I belonged to my kids. Now, my wife and I practiced what we had been taught, which is we found alone times. 
And we would, about every three months, we would take a two-day vacation. And we had a family vacation, all that, but she and I would get away, even sometimes for just an overnight, you know, take off in the morning, come back the next afternoon, get the kids with whoever. And, and so we would, we practiced that, but I, I basically decompressed before I got to the front door of my house. And I'll tell you right now, for most of us as guys, uh, particularly a lot of us working at home, find a place to decompress, find a way to do that. If it's in the garage, go to the garage. If it's take a walk down the street, walk down the street. And then when you come out the door of your office, or if you walk through the front door, whatever it may be of your apartment, belong to your kids because they do not understand that daddy needs decompress time. All they know is mom says, stay away from dad right now. And then they get the idea of, oh, so he's not accessible because the moment you show up, man, you know, kids are like puppies, right? They have no sense of time. Yeah. As far as they're concerned, they've, you've been gone for years, <laughs> you know, and you walk in and they're like, look at this, look at this. And the next one's like, dad. So I walked in the front door and I expected my two boys when they were younger, particularly to come running down the stairs and there was a landing right about head height. And they would jump. And, bro, it was on from then, man. And my daughter would come in with all her stuff she was doing in sports or whatever. You know, it was uh, – and so I, I belonged to them when I showed up. And then my wife and I had times together. Here's, here's another thing I'm doing for my grandchildren right now. I did it with my first one. And I, and I picked this up uh, from a friend of mine named Bob Roberts. And Bob had done this for his family years ago. And so when my granddaughter turned 10 – from the year she turned nine until 10, I carried a pink Bible with her name on it around, and I wrote stories in it of all the things that had happened to me and her grandmother, all the stuff. And, and uh, it was, you know, it was funny because I'd be sitting on a plane or in a cafe writing in this pink Bible. But, you know, that whole thing became uh, an heirloom because I gave it to her on her 10th birthday. And now I've done that for a second a grandchild for Cameron. So Reese got that Bible. And uh, it's been pretty amazing to see uh, her go, Papa, tell me about this story. You wrote it in my Bible. I go, oh, yeah, the plane blew up. Yeah, the plane blew up. And God saved my life. Okay. Yeah, I never told you about that one. I put it in your Bible. So those are intentional things. And then the other thing I always tell guys is, is this, and I still do it with all three of my children. When I see him right now, it's a little difficult, the social distancing crap. But the fact is, is that when I see him, I hug him and kiss him. My boys are in their 30s. They know they're going to get a kiss from dad on the cheek. You know what they do? They do it to their kids. They do it to their kids. And That's it great. centers a child. And you can look up University of Pennsylvania, 19, uh, see 2005, the study on, on the touch of a father and how the touch of a father by physiologically changes the depth and the center of a man or woman's life if they're touched by their father when they're a child and held in their arms. It literally shifts and changes the direction of their life. And now they've tracked this over years. It's pretty amazing. So yeah, touch. It's huge. Well, Paul, man, that time flew by and I know yeah, we've got to wrap it up here but I wanted to give you a minute to tell guys how to get in touch with you, where they can get your books. And you were telling me about this app you, you guys just came out with. Yeah. The app is, is um, CMN radio, Christian men's network, CMN radio. It's in the app store. If you're uh, well, I guess Android or iOS, you can get it in there. And uh, so there's an app and that's 24 seven. I mean, you can in your uh, home or in your car, you can have that on that app on. And uh, it's, it's got messages and ministry and audio books and all kinds of stuff, 24-7. And then cmn.men, Christian Men's Network, cmn.men is where you can get the book Bartender or on Barnes & Noble. And as I tell guys all the time, my, my wife's husband wrote a great book, so I recommend it. <laughs> Her first husband, right? <laughs> yeah, first yeah, that I know of. And then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, – you know, so we do the tools and, and stuff for a discipleship for men to be able to disciple their kids. I started my sons sitting them at the kitchen table when they were nine and 10 years old. 
uh, every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m., which apparently 9 a.m. when you're 9 and 10 is just way too early. <laughs> but I did it. We did it. And I took them through materials that people would say, well, isn't that a man's book, a men's book? I'll go, yeah. And these guys are going to be men. Hmm. So if I had to explain something, I'll explain it. By 9 and 10, the world's putting stuff on it, man. Right? So, of course. Yeah. Well, Paul, man, it's been good speaking with you today. I look forward to future conversations, hopefully. And yeah. um, I appreciate Fantastic. you sharing your wisdom with us today. Yeah, you know, and I'm just proud of you, Patrick, with Dad Hackers. And, I mean, you just kind of bootstrapped this thing, made it happen, uh, stayed with it. This is not easy to do. Uh, it's a lot of hours and time. And, shoot, what did I just edit? And uh, all the yeah. little things that go with it. So, man, well done, Patrick. This is very, very cool. And you and your family, and uh, because they support you and they're going to be behind it because it does take some time. So thank you for doing this. And uh, I'm really praying that all over the world, guys will access this. All right, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope our conversation was a blessing to you and that you leave this episode better equipped to be the man and the father God has called and created you to be. If so, then I ask that you please leave us a five-star rating and a quick written review in iTunes. And make sure you head on over to the show notes to get all of the resources for this episode. While you're there, you can take part in our five days to be a better dad challenge, as well as get involved with our free Facebook community. All right, gentlemen, until next week, remember Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Stay sharp. Stay sharp.